It's good to be with you this morning. It's a beautiful weekend. Wasn't it great to get out and do some work outside? So, uh, I am ready for all of that. I'm going to uh, ask the question this morning, what's next? I mean, we had a great celebration last week. I, I, I don't know about y'all, but I thoroughly enjoyed that worship service. And uh, we just went home. We've talked about it uh, all week long. And, and um, it's just good to come together with God's people and celebrate the greatest event in all of history, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, there's a history still to come that I think is going to be even better. And that's when he returns. And so until that time, we need to ask the question, what's next? So Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Luke, the gospel writer, is writing to Theopolis. Theophilus, I'll get my words out maybe right sometimes. Uh, much has been made of who Theophilus is, a uh, I mean, it's amazing what people study and how much time they put into it, <laughs> when in reality, it was a very common Greek name, and we have no doubt, and I guess our best understanding is he was just writing to a friend of his named Theophilus, and just wants to continue the narrative that he has started in the gospel that he finished up with. But he writes this, he said, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over and over, uh, over a period of 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days." So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. They were all continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for this record of uh, not only your life, but the life of your disciples. And Father, this instruction that has been uh, kept for us by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would know how we ought to respond as followers of Christ, as your disciples, as those adopted sons and daughters. And so, Lord, we uh, pray that you will open our hearts today to receive your word. Pray for your messenger that you will uh, not let me be distracted, Father, that I surrender myself to you, that, Father, that, that what the, is spoken here truly is directed by your spirit. And Father, I pray for all of us that we would have hearts, courageous hearts, to hear your word, to receive it, and then to live it out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's a great scene here, and as I said, it was a great celebration last week, and, and I love those kind of celebrations. In fact, the, the Bible is full of celebrations, memorial, festivals, feasts, and they're all for a particular reason, and, and I think we need to embrace those and need to hang on to those. Um, and as the Bible models this for us, uh, we need to understand that these festivals and these feasts are not a one and done thing. I appreciate you picking up in your teaching today. Um, I, I'll, I was going to call you everything but your name, Alan. Ben, James, John. Yeah, maybe it was the list of disciples I was reading. 
but reminding us the work of Jesus still goes on as our high priest. And so our work needs to go on. And, and so celebrations like what we had last week are, are supposed to inspire us, encourage us, keep us connected to the mission that, are, that is before us. You know, it, it, when I think about celebrations, one of the first ones that come to my mind is birthdays, right? And we celebrate those every year, but that is a one and done thing. You're only going to be 21 once. I'm trying to convince myself of that. As I was working out in the yard yesterday, I am not 21 anymore. But isn't that like birthdays? When we're kids, we have a birthday, and we, as soon as our birthday's over, we can't wait for the next one. We already eagerly start talking about, and kids, you ask them their age, I'm 11 and a quarter. I'm 11 and a half. You know, I'm 11 and three quarters. They know. But isn't it interesting as we get older, and at our house, we celebrate the day that we don't mention. Okay. It's a secret. But we celebrate those, and then what we want is those birthdays to slow down. They just seem to come fast and furious and, and, and can pass us up. But, but we need to understand that these celebrations, these memorials, like we had last week and, and others that we're going to look at, and as we lead up to Pentecost, these are to uh, be used to move us and to, uh, to uh, deepen our walk with Christ and to shape us. Uh, they become spiritual markers, I believe, for us of our growth in our lives it helps us to stay connected i think of abraham and his journeys and at this time uh, his name is still abram in genesis 13 but he just pulled the little stunt with pharaoh in, in egypt and, and and saying that you know sarah's my sister not my wife because he was fearful that they would kill him and take her and you, you know the story there that happens uh, god came to pharaoh spoke to him and pharaoh said look you are leaving I've got guys that are going to help you, escort you out to make sure you do leave, but also to appease your God, I'm giving you all this wealth to take with you. Now, I've just summarized, you know, a good bit of Genesis in about 30 seconds there. But what Abram did when he left there is he retraced his steps back through the Negev. In fact, that's on this next slide. The Negev to Bethel, where he first built his altar, where the, his first altar was built. And what it says there in Genesis 13 is that he retraced his steps, he went back to Bethel, and what he did is he worshiped God. We come back to those places so that they are a reminder of who God is, what he's doing in our lives, and it reconnects us back to him and keeps us there. And, and even though we know as Abram's story will develop, this is going to be a recurring theme with him. In fact, I think it's a recurring theme with most of us uh, who are humans, that we tend to want to take things back into our hands. But one thing Abraham teaches us is that he always went back to the altar. He always went back to the source. He, he reminds us that we need to stay connected to him. Luke reminds us in Acts that the end of Jesus' work was not with the ascension. We sometimes talk about that, and we'll talk about his earthly ministry was done. Well, I even think that's a wrong statement. Because I'm grateful that we have a high priest that is sitting at the right hand of the Father who is interceding for us. In fact, there's some that have said his work didn't end with the ascension. What it did was it began with the ascension. And really probably what we should say, it just continues. And it will continue. It will continue until he comes back. The final work of Jesus was just the beginning, but he now is ascended to the Father and he is seated by the Father where he intercedes for us, where he waits in obedience for the Father to tell him to come back and get his children. I love that thought. I love the words of the angels. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him go. This little phrase has bothered me all week. Now, I say bothered me. It's captured me. I, I think it's fascinating. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned it to a couple friends of mine, and and, you know, it's one of those that we say often, but we don't uh, connect with or stop and pause. We read through scriptures too fast sometimes, and we just need to slow down and think about it. But this same Jesus, this is the Jesus that was born of a woman who served and taught, who was crucified, who was buried, and who was resurrected, and who ascended back to the Father. This is the Jesus who will return won't be a spirit, won't be a ghost, as some of them like to think of who Jesus was when he was resurrected from the dead. And I love the gospel writers that help us understand, especially Luke, 
that indeed he was very much who he was. He was resurrected. His, his body was resurrected. He ate with them. He spent time with them. He worked with them. This same Jesus, not a spirit, not a ghost. And by the way, not another Jesus. There are many, many who have come over ages and who are yet to come who will claim his spot. None of them will do. It is this same Jesus, this same Jesus that we celebrated last week that will return. The one who paid the, uh, for the sins of the world, the one who bears the scars for his sacrifice, the one who redeems us and sustains us, this is the Jesus that will return one day. And I look forward to that. Especially after digging in the yard all day yesterday, I thought this would be a good night for Jesus to come. Okay, I'll get off of that kick a little bit. So Jesus is doing his work. Well, what's our work? We've asked the question, what's next, right? Our work is not to just sit around and wait for Jesus to return. In fact, Jesus is going to give us instruction. He gives instruction to his disciples here. Luke reminds us that Jesus gives us words uh, that are to be lived out as our purpose for our lives until he returns. And it's a simple thing. People always want to know what the will of God is for their lives. And at the end of the day, what those kind of things are, are, what are, what is the choice that God would have me to make in my life? The will for us is to be his ambassadors, to go to Jerusalem, to go to Judea, to go to Samaria, and go to the ends of the earth being his evangelist, to be his representative, to share the good news about his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and the fact that he's coming back someday. We need to be busy in what we are doing as serving him as his uh, ambassadors. In verses 1 through 5, Luke ties the book of Acts back to his gospel, uh, a sequel, if you will, to, um, so it's, it's Luke 1, then Luke 2, the acts, of G- <laughs> the acts of the church or whatever. I don't know. I probably shouldn't have tried to go Hollywood there. Let's just get back to the idea that he wrote this book as a follow-up to what he had already written about the life of Christ. And he instructs them, and I thought this was another interesting phrase, he instructs them through the Holy Spirit. Now some have, have said, but the Spirit hasn't fallen on them yet, so how are they being instructed? This is a reference to the fact and reminding us that Jesus never did anything of his own. If you remember, John tells us in particular, I only do what I see the Father doing. Apart from the Father, I can do nothing. And so Jesus' whole earthly ministry was led by the Spirit. And I think that's what he's referring to here. But I think he's recording this and helping us to understand this truth because it's going to be a big truth that we need to uh, have in our lives because this is the promise the Father's going to send. This is the, uh, the one that's going to indwell us, the same spirit that, that indwelled Jesus, that, that uh, led him in all that he did, that gave him the power and the ability to accomplish what he did, is that same spirit that's going to indwell his followers. Those of us who have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior and surrendered our lives to him, that same spirit that led Jesus now leads us. It's really kind of, and I know we talk about, right, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, We talk about those things, but sometimes I think we need to pull back and really think about those things and understand that Jesus was our example, right? He came here to be our example of how to live and operate and and be in the kingdom of God. And then beyond that, he became our redeemer. He he gave himself up. He sacrificed himself so that we could be uh, back in relationship with God, have our sins forgiven, and enter back into that place where God intended for us to be in the first place. And But part of that example and part of his willingness and part of his obedience, it was only because of the spirit that led him and indwelled him. And that is the same spirit that has been given to us. Jesus said, trust the spirit with his life. In verses 6 to 8, the disciples say after this is, uh, they've received this instruction, they said, is it the time for your kingdom to be established on earth? And what's, you know, the famous thing? And we love this. We love to throw this around. Anytime somebody prognosticates about when the end of the world's going to come, we say, only God knows the time. But if you're like me, I look at the times. I look at the signs. And I really want to try to convince God it's, it, you know, it's time. But only God knows. 
Only God knows that time. That's not to be our question. In fact, Jesus, because of his emphasis on giving them the, what we call the Great Commission of going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, he's not concerned about what's to come. He's not concerned about the time he returns. What he's concerned about, in fact, he doesn't even mention it. It's the angels that mention it to, these, to the disciples. Well, I said angels. It says two white men in robes. I'm, I'm kind of making an assumption. They just didn't pop out of any, you know. They came from somewhere. And... Uh, what we need to understand is that Jesus' perspective, Jesus' focus was on the kingdom present. Look, you're still here. The work of God is not done. I'm calling you into ministry with me. I'm calling you to be evangelists for me. I'm calling you to be my ambassadors. I'm calling you to be the light of the world. Live in it. We need to be concerned with the present, not so much about what's coming. You know, there's these old phrases that, uh, that we can be so uh, uh, heavenly minded we're no earthly good truth of the matter there's another way to say that we can be so earthly good we're no heaven, earthly minded we're no heavenly good what we need to do is we need to come for that and we need to come and understand that we've been placed here and we need to live in the kingdom present I look forward to that kingdom to come when I have led in funerals and celebrations of people's lives I remind them of the hope that we have in the resurrection and I remind them that, uh, that one day God is going to restore everything to, to where he intended it to be. But that's not to be our focus. And truthfully, many of us spend our lives with that. You know, I spent my early years thinking, I just need to get you so that you, uh, you have your eternity secure. Now, that's important, right? But what we do is we get so zealous about getting people to believe in Jesus that we forget to have them follow Jesus. And that's the kingdom present. We know the hope to come. We know the promise that is ours. But we need to be involved in the work that he has set before us. With those words, verses 9 through 11, Jesus then ascended into heaven. And much is made about heaven. And as I already said, we can be so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. So what we need to do is we don't need to be concerned with that. In fact, it's a done deal, right? We believe it. I don't hope that's going to happen. I like what the writer of Hebrews says about hope. You know, it is a secure thing. It is a confident thing. It's not like when I used to have to take tests, you know, I hope I pass this. I can count on it. I can lay my head on my pillow at night, close my eyes, and know the fact that if I leave this world, Jesus will come and get me, and he, I will be present with him. We need to be focused on what's going on here. We need to trust and believe the fact that, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and let that be there so we can move our attention to what do we do while we're here, while we're still in the body. By the way, to be absent from the body be present with the Lord, I'm not sure I can adequately explain that. I honestly can't. I mean, we understand there's this new heaven and new earth coming. We don't understand that Jesus is coming back for us on one day and is going to establish his kingdom but what is that in between? And there are so many thoughts about that. So many doctrines, so many points of view. Here's what I like to do, and this is, this is where I, 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 I land my, where I land on, is the only way that I can best express it is through the words of Jesus himself to the thief on the cross. When the one thief who was railing on him, the other thief interrupted and says, dude, we are here because it is just, we have committed crimes, we're supposed to be put to death but this man is righteous and he looks at Jesus and in that moment believes and says when you come into your kingdom remember me and what does Jesus say today I, you will be with me in paradise paradise now I don't know where that's at we love to sing songs about it we love to sing songs about streets of gold and gates of pearl and uh, I remember an old time pastor one time preaching on that passage about the gates of pearl he said, you know, I think that would be impressive to see, but what I want to see is the oyster that pearl came out of. And <laughs> I would do. It might be a little scary. Here's what I know, is that when I close my eyes here, I will know that I have died as a follower of Christ when I open my eyes and I see Jesus. Now, I have to, I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. Where is that? It's paradise. It's in his presence. And we need to work towards that day when he does come back and establish everything that he's going to do in his new heaven and his new earth. Where the Bible says the lion lays down with the lamb. 
we're in this new heaven and this new earth that, that is going to be restored to God's original intention. And the difference this time, and don't miss this fact, when we enter into that kingdom to come and when he restores it at that time, the beautiful part about that is there will no longer be any temptation to sin that would separate us from God. Isn't that great? We get to spend eternity continuing to discover who God is, but now we do it without anything that might cause distraction or take us away or break our fellowship with him. We'll be in that original place. And I believe as, as, the, as Genesis describes God coming down and being among his people, that's exactly where he's going to be. It's a great day that's coming. But we would do well in verses 12 through 14 to learn the lessons that the disciples learn. That until that time, until that time, we need to believe, we need to trust, and we need to obey. I mean, amidst of all that uh, was going on in the lives of that dis- the disciples at that time, I mean, think about it. They've just been through a horrendous couple months. You know, they went from the tops where they're riding into Jerusalem with Jesus riding in, they're following him, to the victorious celebration, you know, Palm Sunday and, and all that goes with that, celebrating, thinking the Messiah's come, he's going to establish his kingdom here, and we're in on the ground floor. A long way, Jesus is teaching them about humility, about service, and about obedience. And then they come to the place where they watch him be put to death on the cross, and they think all of their hopes and dreams are dashed. And, and I'm certain they were going, we know that's who he was. We know that he was the Son of God. We, because of what he did, he is the Messiah. But they see him be put to death. And it's not until his resurrection that it comes full circle. And I think finally the disciples start to go, ah, I think I get it. But they're still thinking earthly kingdom. And that's why they ask the question, is it now time for you to restore your kingdom on earth? And I'm certain they were confused when he says, You're not, that's not for you to be concerned with. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Jerusalem, stay in Jerusalem, gather together, and pray. The disciples did that. They went. They, they, they went. They gathered together, and they were united in prayer. We need to learn this idea of trusting, believing, and obeying. We've all experienced one time or another in our lives, events or crises, the adversities of lives, times that these things crowd in on us and we struggle to make sense of what God is doing. But we need to be like Abraham, where we return to the altar. We, we actually are more like Abraham where we take matters into our own hands, but we, we need to learn from Abraham that when we do, we need to know that God doesn't just discard us. What we need to do is go back and turn to him and surrender our lives to him. We need to trust in the work of Christ in our life. We ultimately need to know that out of our surrender and our trust, he will work all things together for the good. And we need to throw that on the end no matter what happens. We need to get to the place where we truly understand and we pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is saying, I trust you completely. I'm not saying I always like the outcome. You grow into that because you start to see the work of God in your life how he's deepening you in that. If you'll lean into that and you'll rely upon him, if you'll be like Abraham and go to the altar and stay connected to God, he will work this in your life for good. That's how we face each and every day. We need to believe that, in, that Jesus is the Christ. And when we pray, we need to pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we need to pray believing in Jesus, trusting Jesus, and obeying Jesus. You know, it's really this simple. The disciples did as Jesus instructed them. Isn't it? Now, I want you to think of the scene, right? There they are. They've just spent 40 days with him. And he's he's given them final instructions. They're now out on the mountain. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, it's time for me to go. Wait, are you going to restore the kingdom first? Not for you to know. But what you just need to do is go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And with that, he ascended back to the Father. I don't know about you, but in a lot of congregations, when we see things like that happen, right, we go, we've got to figure this out. What's he talking about? Is this real? Am I still going to stay a part of this? But we need to stay a part of it because it is truth. 
And it is what he's called us to do. And we need to be as just as simple and, and real as the disciples were. And we just need to trust him. We need to, we need to go to Jerusalem. We need to stay until the promise of the Father comes upon us. We need to be gathered and united in what we do. And the way we do that is we're united in prayer. In the days ahead, I think we'll uh, look at some things in Acts that will help us to understand that by that simple act of obedience by the disciples, by going and staying in Jerusalem, by not leaving and doing as the Father said, we will see the internal impact of that. Now I want you to capture that, the internal impact of that. Because of that act of obedience with them, the Spirit came. The promise of the Father came upon us and still dwells among us today. And I am grateful today that I don't have to rely upon Steve Long because when I surrendered my life to Christ, he took the old man nature out. He put the new nature, his nature, within me, fully indwelling me, changing me, transforming me for all eternity. And I rest with the fact of knowing that when I stand before God, I don't stand before him on my own merit. I stand before him on the merits of Jesus. And it's because of this promise he gave us, the eternal impact. I am grateful today for the lives of the disciples and the way that they follow through with believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, and obeying Jesus. And I guess that would be my simple question today as we come to conclusion. What would it be like in our lives and in our churches if we would really, truly believe Jesus? if we really trust him at his word, if we would become people who are obedient to what he says, and then finally, to be united in prayer. See, to be united in prayer means that we are going to be of one mind, one spirit, one Lord, focused on him. And that only happens through that relationship. Pray, Pray in your own prayer closets, but prayer, praying here, there's nothing that will unite any, any group more than when they pray together. Tomorrow I have the privilege of going to prison. I forgot to tell you guys about that. Actually, this is the second time we get to go in the Toledo Corrections Institute. We lead a one-day prayer boot camp. And these are selected men by the chaplain there, Ken Rupert, who uh, sign up for this, about 24 men. So keep that in prayer tomorrow as we walk them through this prayer boot camp, what prayer can do in their lives, continuing to transform their lives and preparing them for when they step back in to society. The last time I was there, it was an amazing time. I expect the same there. But the way that we know transformation is really gonna take place and uh, know that they can integrate back into society is they've got to be connected to the one who can do it. And that's only through prayer. But I would say to us, as the people of God, that's the only way we move forward. That's the only way we know what's next. And that's the only way we take the steps to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. To Holland, to Maumee, Sylvania, Toledo, the White House, Grand Rapids, wherever it may be. For some, it may be even to other places in the United States or around this world. We get there by being united in prayer. If I know I've got a base of people praying with me, it gives me so much more confidence to step out and to be a person who reflects the fact that I believe who Jesus is, that I trust him at his word, and I walk obediently. I think it's a good challenge for us to consider, ponder, and then practice. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the instructions. We thank you, Father, that uh, the work just didn't end with Easter. It really, for us, begins with Easter. We thank you that you are at the right hand of the Father and you are interceding on our behalf. But Father, I know you want to do uh, in our lives what you did in the lives of the disciples. I don't believe there's another Pentecost uh, event that would take place, but Father, for us, in a real symbolic kind of way, there can be that where we can come together and as a people be united in prayer, trusting and following you in everything that we do. It's where we hear from you and we make those right choices and we live obedient. 
because it's your spirit, the promise the Father has given to us that gives us the ability to do so. For without him, we could never believe, we could never trust, and we could never be obedient. Lord, may you be glorified and honored in all we do. In Christ's name I pray, amen.